Hello, welcome to the Cyber Weekly. The Cyber Weekly is a podcast which talks about cyber security with me, Delgrasha Sokelo, and uh, Josephine Olok, my co-host, who is unfortunately not here <laughs> in absentia. Um, but yeah, so uh, today we are having uh, Dr. Johannes Ulrich. Let me quickly go through his profile. He started his education at Julius Maximilian University of Wolfsburg. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing it well. That's close enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where he did physics uh, at an under- undergraduate, then University of Albain, where he did his master's in physics, and uh, University of Albain again, where he did his PhD. Uh, when it comes to certificates, uh, uh, he has a certificate in uh, from GIA, which is uh, intrusion analysis, and uh, then another one from GIA called advisory board member, then uh, GIA certified web application defender, then GIA network forensics analyst, GIA, GIA continuous monitoring certificate. Then uh, when it comes to work, X-ray optics is where he began from. Then I uh, followed by Equilidian, where he's currently still the president. Banter, D Shield, which uh, is the president currently. Uh, Sons Institute. Uh, he started as the web development and system administration certified. Uh, then he followed by certified instructor, chief research officer, uh, senior instructor. Then he's now a fellow. Uh, so when it comes to Science Technology Institute, he is the Dean of Research currently since 2010, then Director of Internet Storm Center. Uh, I, I was trying to do it in one lot, <laughs> not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> So, yeah, that is Dr. Johannes Ulrich. So, uh, Dr. Johannes Ulrich, uh, first of all, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into cybersecurity. Yeah, uh, right now I'm living in Jacksonville, Florida, if you're not familiar with the United States of the Southern United States, where it's nice and warm, uh, but uh, in particular in the winter, people like it here. Uh, I grew up in Germany, where it's a lot colder. Uh, that's where I've got my undergraduate education, then moved to the United States. And as you read earlier, my education is pretty much in physics. So then I switched from physics to more computer science and security. And that happened like with so many people with an incident. You first need to have something bad happen to worry about security. Uh, oh, that's yeah. how it often happens. Uh, for me, it was sort of a little incident. It was uh, my research in physics dealt with x-rays. And with x-rays, you always try to stand back a little bit. You don't try to be too close. So I wrote a lot of software to remote control experiments. And one day I received a cable modem at home. So I was able to use a high-speed connection from home to connect to my experiments back at school. But to make this work, I had to build like a little router. And um, back then, this was like in the 90s, a lot of these cheap routers you have now with like D-Link, Linksys, they didn't exist yet. So uh, you could buy a Cisco one, which I couldn't afford as a poor student, uh, or you have to build your own, which back then meant linux you, know, you can still do, a lot of people still do that where they build their own little routers and you know like these linksys routers are just linux but um, of course i didn't know what i was doing i was just uh, plugging cables in until it worked and uh, you know networking first rule when it works stop touching it don't touch it, <laughs> don't touch it when it works <laughs> but the problem was that my isp called me that uh, i was sending spam uh you may remember it's like back in the 90s one of the early spams was uh in united states has green card lottery i'm not that old but and people (laughs) (laughs) you're you're too young for that (laughs) and uh 
uh, this is one of the early spams and someone uh, and back then linux when you installed it was automatically a mail server um because back then everybody was nice on the internet and uh, people helped each other but so i learned about hey you have to turn off services you don't need i learned about firewalls and uh, then i looked at my firewall logs and what i noticed was everybody was attacking me yeah. there were people from all over the world they're from uganda people were trying to break into my system <laughs> <laughs> and i was wondering why you know why is someone in uganda interested in breaking into my system so i did more research and you know being physics researcher i collected data um and i built a little system called the shield where people could send me their logs and would aggregate them. It would basically create sort of a global map of where all the attackers are. And we found out they're everywhere, the attackers, and what attacks are they launching? And that got me then more and more into security until uh, 2001-ish, kind of. Uh, I started working with SANS and then you know, became more of an instructor with SANS. In between, I was... A web developer for a while uh but yeah so that's a little bit about myself and how i got where i am now yeah. so uh it came out of circumstance <laughs> yeah <laughs> it circumstance. it just happened kind of <laughs> <laughs> so i uh, have spent 23 years at sans institute 14 years at sans technology institute and most by before even i continue what's the difference between sans institute and sans technology institute yeah, that's a question a lot of people have. And mm -hmm. uh, SANS Institute is a professional training company. Okay. And SANS Technology Institute is a subsidiary. It's basically owned by SANS Institute. So the two companies are related like that. So one is for technology, one is for education. Yeah, the SANS Technology Institute is actually an accredited cre uh, school, an accredited university. So with sans technology institute you can take classes for college credit well sans institute is professional training uh, so people who want to advance their careers or so they can take a class or so with sans institute so sans technology is more for academia yeah when sans institute is for certificates yeah yeah okay yeah so uh, you've spent uh, 23 years uh, at SANS Institute and uh, 14 years at SANS Technology Institute. And most of these have been as an instructor and in research. What motivated you to get involved in education and academia? I think it's curiosity, just wanting to explore what's out there. Like I said, you know, when I first got hacked you know with this i just want to see how how did attack works why are people doing it uh and i'm just curious like this and academia and such allows me to spend the time doing research and uh, following all these different threats so that's kind of what motivates me and what got me where i am now okay as soon as you just go down the d rabbit hole yes yeah, go down the rabbit hole and see what you find sometimes you find a rabbit sometimes a rat yes <laughs> <laughs> i guess that's why you when you reached up for phd for your physics yes yes yeah, yeah. so it was just you said oh let me first do the, the bachelor's then the master then the did it just he, come at all at once or no it's of one after another and uh I, the transition was then like you know, basically having that background in physics, sort of collecting data, analyzing data, uh, that very much applies to cybersecurity as well, because it's just different data. Instead of having data about uh, you know, radiation measurements and such, now you have firewall locks and uh, the analysis process is really the same. And you have to come up then with your research question, what would you like to find out? and then you see how can you use the data to actually answer that question. So uh, your transition, actually, it wasn't so tedious. It, because you were already researching, it helped push you. It, it helped. And uh, in when I was doing physics, I was you know, working a lot with computers, with networks. I was writing a lot of software. So a lot of the hands-on stuff is actually kind of similar. Uh, 
Um, yes, I get to play less with high voltage power supplies and vacuum systems now than I did in my physics days. Uh, but um, a lot of the techniques sort of overlap, actually. Okay. So uh, there, is, there is the sun's uh, technology where you are the dean. Then there is the sun's institute where you are a fellow. Ah, oh my god, I'm reading the question where I already asked. <laughs> <laughs> I already asked the question, I'm sorry. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so let me go to the next one. Mm. So you created the Internet Storm Center, which um, has been recognized uh, multiple times uh, with industry awards. What motivated you to create it and how did, uh, did the daily podcast come about? Yeah, so uh, the Internet Storm Center evolved out of the Shield.org. I mentioned earlier the Shield.org is a website I started to collect the logs. SANS at the same time had a similar effort called Incidents.org. Incidents.org was started in 99, actually, probably way before you were born. Uh, and uh, it. Uh, I'm feeling too young now. <laughs> 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 and I remember that Y2K, that's sort of why Incense.org was started in 99. Uh, and Incense.org was where people could just write in and say, hey, you know, we're seeing this in our network. And uh, you would then sort of write it up and uh, basically ask people, hey, you know, what is this an attack or something like this. But when I started working for Sense, we basically joined Incense.org, the Shield.org, together to the Internet Storm Center. And with the Internet Storm Center today, we have hundreds of people that run our little honeypots that basically detect attacks and then send the logs to us. Uh, so we get you know millions of logs every day that we aggregate in the big database, and then we can see any new attacks that evolve out of uh, it. So that's, that's sort of what the Internet Storm Center does. The podcast came a little bit later. And the podcast was just because people were asking for it. Hey, you know, it's useful what you write on our, your website. But on our website, we usually only sort of cover one thing, one story. Uh, there are other things that are interesting uh, that we need to know. So the way I set up the podcast is I record it here in the United States sort of late in the evening, which usually means that in the United States and even like in Europe and Africa, you can read it on your way to work. That's sort of how it's designed. So you l listen to it on the way to work. Yeah. And it's supposed to make you sound smarter when you get to work. So when you get to work, some of the things that I covered will hopefully be things that you have to deal with, like you know, some vulnerabilities, some new exploits or things like that. Uh, so that way you already get a head start and you already heard a little bit about uh, what you may be seeing that day at work. Yeah. Fun fact is... Um when I was starting out with the podcast and um, on the newsletter, what I used to do is uh, I actually got to know about your podcast through a guy called Dan Glass. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him, no. but uh, uh, it was through a mentorship program uh, for Cybercity. So what happened was uh, he told me, ah, oh, there's this incredible podcast, which is good for SOC analysts because mm -hmm. that's the career path uh, I'm opting for. And he told me, ah, you should listen to it. I was like, okay. So when it came to creating the podcast and uh, coming up with ideas, you are my secret source. So all the, <laughs> <laughs> all the ideas, work, yeah. <laughs> all the ideas of the sites which I can look for vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. sites which I, so I just collect. In fact, I have a, a Google Notes. Uh, so mm -hmm. I just go and just look through those sites which you've already recommended. Mm -hmm. And then use it. Yeah. So yeah, that was that. That's that's uh, one thing I I enjoy about your podcast because there is always something new and it's current and you know. Yeah. So uh, you are my it, it's short so. too, kind of. Uh, so you can actually, yeah. even if you work at home, kind of, you can on the way from the bedroom to the kitchen yeah. or such, you can listen to it. Yes. Um, but um, yeah, and uh, it's also short because I don't have much more time to spend on creating it every day uh, yeah. but yeah it's uh it works and like i said it's hopefully also making you smarter not just make you sound smarter uh, but mm -hmm. at the very least should make you sound smarter when you get to work and so your boss will like you and you get promoted and 
<laughs> yeah. So yeah, the my secret sauce. I'm already sharing my secret sauce around. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, how do you come about with the ideas uh, for the podcast? Well, in part, it's some of the attacks I'm seeing with our sensors. Now, that, of course, helps uh, to also see if something is real. Uh, there are people that just sent me things because you know, once you are popular and have a podcast, people say, hey, cover this and that. Yeah. Uh, now, a lot of them are marketing people, and I delete those. You know, where, uh, <laughs> they just want to. Uh, but. Um, then um, there's a lot of practitioners like you, a stock analyst, that say, hey, you know, I saw this. And that's, that's usually the best thing uh, because that's something real that's out there. So that helps. And then I have sort of a list of just websites that I just check every day to see what's new, what's different. And uh, yeah, so that gives me the idea sort of for the podcast. Yeah. Okay. And then I look at basically things that are actionable. Uh, you notice I probably don't really cover much about companies that got hacked or such, yeah. uh, because I usually find that's not really that useful for you, like as an analyst, yeah? Yeah. knowing that some other company get hacked. Often it's people like to talk about it because it makes you feel good because someone else got hacked too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, unless they talk about, hey, this is how we got hacked. This is what you have to do to protect yourself. Uh, I may cover that because that's useful, but just the fact that some bank lost your data again, that's not really that useful. <laughs> and those stories have been common. Yeah. So, and yeah, then yeah. less actionable. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, could you explain uh, to us uh, the Sun's Diary and how it would be beneficial for one to read? So, first of all, why do we call it diary? Uh, again, we started in 99 the term blog didn't exist back then yet. Uh, today, you would probably call it a blog. Uh, <laughs> as when it happened, from there to <laughs> And I, I actually like the term diary because diary is like, you know, what you write down, what mattered to you that day. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, our diaries are not written by journalists or professional writers. Uh, they're written by, you know, people in the field like you and me that, just, hey, I saw something interesting. I created this neat tool that helped me today. So that's really what the diaries are about. And I think that's what differentiates them. They're very personal in that sense. We have our handlers, as we call them. Uh, it's sort of you know, selected people that we invite to write. Uh, and all of them have sort of their own little personal preference. Uh, like you know, Didier, for example, he's in Belgium. Uh, he's a Python master. And he wrote That's all these scripts to <laughs> analyze uh, office documents. And uh, so he writes about that because that's interesting to him. And it's interesting to a lot of people too. Uh, or today, for example, we had one uh, from uh, Inji. He's in uh, Singapore. And the group he's worked on works out on like 5G uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so he wrote about that. Uh, so it's what these people are personally interested, invested in, uh, that they write about. And I think that makes these more real. Um, yes, they sometimes may have spell check errors, but uh, they are not written by professional writers. They're written by uh, normal people, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think uh, uh, it's more people who are interested in something, and especially yeah. people in, in the cybersecurity industry and IT in general, yeah. who want something we just, you know, Create a tool, yes, show, show people, and yeah, yeah, life goes on. And I actually recommend that everybody should have like a blog or something like this. Mm. Uh, it helps you even find your own tools later. Because if you wrote about it, then you can just Google for it. And it's always nice if you Google for a tool and you actually shows your own tool. Uh, so, uh, that, the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So um so now um when it comes to vulnerabilities, uh, what vulnerabilities have stood out for you and uh, for you and uh, and how did you handle it with the vendor? Yeah, it's sort of um there are a bunch of interesting ones. I'm just thinking about what we're never like, no, Heartbleed, I think was one that sticks out a little bit, a more recent one. Uh, one that I actually think, in particular, vendor interaction was a very old one. 
um, WMF. And uh, this may again be a vulnerability that you don't quite remember. I think this was, was this 2010, I think it was before 2010, maybe 2005 ish or so, uh, when that came out. And it was a very easy to exploit vulnerability in a file format, this WMF file format. So the widely used file format, but Windows uses that file format. It's an image file format, and it came out right around the Christmas, New Year holidays. So everybody was, of course, you know, busy with preparing for vacations and such. Mm-hmm. And um, we, at the time, were trying to work with Microsoft in responding to this vulnerability. And uh, at the time, Microsoft really wasn't ready yet to sort of deal with researchers, uh, deal with these emerging vulnerabilities. I remember we sent them a bunch of example files we found, like exploits that we found in the wild. And on a phone call, they told us, well, there are no exploits that we know of. And we told them, hey, uh, we sent them to you yesterday. Um, Yeah, but we haven't looked at them yet. And until we look at them, they don't exist. And so, uh, <laughs> and actually Microsoft then in the year following that uh, changed a lot in how they dealt with their internal processes and uh, how they sort of um, worked with the community. Uh, they became a lot more open about you know, exchanging information and such. Uh, so this was really interesting to see how a big company like Microsoft can change for the better and uh, really sort of you know, uh, add that capability that it didn't have before. Uh, based on feedback, not just from us, we were really just a minor uh, part in that. Uh, so I, I, I thought that was a real interesting vulnerability. Heartbleed was interesting in a similar way because I think it uh, drew a lot of attention to the problem of open source security, uh, where it was then known, oh, open SSL, that like you know trillion of dollars of e-commerce is running over web servers that use open SSL, uh, but it's really only two, maybe three people who work on this and they do it part-time in their spare time. Uh, so where then companies like Google and such got together and said, hey, we probably have to put some money behind this and hire a couple people to do a security review and such to make that better. And I think these are sort of these incidents that really uh, help the community move forward and become better. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, um, one of the debates we usually have in class uh, is... Um, Open source and uh, a commercial product. Yeah. What do you think about that? That that that. that? I think it depends a little bit on your um, attitude to it. Uh, I'm a big open source fan. Uh, I have to admit that. So uh, I'm always a little bit on the open source side here. Uh, I think open source side has a couple things going for it. Uh, first of all, if you buy a commercial product, you're really paying money for a lot of open source. Uh, if you look at a product, uh, what was it lately? Ivanti, for example, the firewall that had a lot of issues. Uh, if you look at their source code, a lot of it is written in Perl. Uh, some of the newer one is Python. So there are all these open source products, open source libraries that you pay a lot of money for. And you still have to spend a lot of time securing them, maintaining them, patching them. Uh, in the end, uh, vendors have become really bad in supporting some of these legacy products. Uh, with an open source product, at least you know what's in there. And you know its problems better than in a closed source product. Plus, like in Avanti, like you have a product like Pulse Secure, which was a firewall. It had a great team behind it. They moved it ahead. And then they sold it to Avanti, everybody got laid off, and now they just charge you money for a product they don't really know how it works. Uh, so um, uh, I, that's why I'm a big proponent of open source. Uh, open source is not free. I'm totally agreeing with that. Yeah, you definitely you should pay for support for an open source product. Yeah? You have to invest some time, but uh, at least you know how it works. At least you know how to help yourself if you need to. Uh, with a closed source product, you still have to spend the time. It's not that they work out of the box. Uh, so I don't think you really save that much in time when it comes to closed source to commercial products. Uh, it just gets more expensive and sometimes more difficult to help yourself. So when it comes to that also, uh, people have that worry that, you know what, I'm having a product which, let's say, 
if I have an issue, it's very hard for me to address it. Yeah. That is like usually the biggest issue when it comes to open source products. Well, how would you address that? Well, for open source products, you have the community that it will help you. Mm-hmm. And that's, of course, when you select the product, something you have to be aware of. Uh, not every open source product is the same same way with commercial products. So you have to vet your product. So if you decide to use an open source product, you have to make sure, is there a company I can get support for if I need to, let's say, products like Suricata. You know, there, there are companies that will offer commercial support uh, for it. Uh, and uh, then is there an active community behind it that I can ask for help? So like, are there some you know, Reddit groups or mailing lists or things like this uh, that I can ask for help? And you know, we'll watch this for a while, see how it works. Is the product still maintained? So are there regular updates for it? Not just security updates, but feature updates too. So is someone working on it? Uh, these are the things that you have to look for. But the same thing you have to look at for a commercial product too. Like how often does it happen that you know some router that you bought for home, well, the manufacturer decides, hey, I'm no longer going to support this. Uh, and then you're left with a brick that you can <laughs> doesn't protect you from online attack, or maybe it protects you from a burglar because you can throw it at them <laughs> or so. But uh, that's um, uh, that, that happens with commercial products too. Uh-huh. That's an interesting thought because uh, most of the time you're thinking, oh, open source, oh, you know. But uh, now, uh, when it comes to that also, um, when it comes to students, what have you noticed as a key differentiator between those who make it inside? Curiosity and willingness to ask the questions. That's really what a lot of this is about. So uh, being able to go down those rabbit holes Because one thing that's really important when it comes uh, to cybersecurity is things change all the time. It's not that you can learn it and you'll be set for life. Uh, You have to keep yourself updated. You have to stay curious to really uh, see what's new and different about it. Uh, Cybersecurity is the field where the only constant is change. So things will change all the time. It's not that you get your degree and you're done. Uh, it's not sort of like accounting or something like this, uh, where you know once you know how accounting works, I think at least as an outsider, you, you kind of know it. Uh, but uh, in cybersecurity, things change every day. Uh, if you take a l- long lunch break, by the time you get back, everything changed. <laughs> so you have to have the ability to really explore things, experiment, ask questions. Uh, and that overall curiosity is really what matters. Okay. So uh, then, um, what when it comes to advising, what what advice would you give someone who is getting started into cybersecurity? Let's say tools which someone would start with to you know harness their skills. Which tools would you recommend someone to start with? I think stick to the basics. Uh, learn about networks. Uh, play with a tool like TSB Dump, Wireshark. Uh, understand how networks work. Maybe create a little web application yourself. You know, it's not that hard. You know, um, of course, take it down because it will probably be vulnerable when you create it. But uh, so you know how the mechanics work. Uh, how does data that you enter into a form actually end up in a database? Uh, so be, stick to these basics and uh, figure out how things work. Or one of the biggest dangers of cybersecurity for the newcomers. There's so much cool stuff that you can do that's really not that important. Uh, like uh, I see a lot of people new to cybersecurity play with Flipper Zero. You know Flipper Zero, the little wireless tool? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do amazing things with it. You can clone keys. But do you actually know what it does? Uh, you only know how to press the button. Uh, to uh, to launch the attack, to copy the key, uh, but you don't know what happens. So really figure out how things work. That's, I think, more important. And stick to the basics because vulnerabilities keep repeating themselves. That's like what I learned in my over 20 years. While it, everything changes, it's also always the same. It's always someone forgetting to validate input, someone not properly encoding output. Uh, 
someone uh, not properly parsing unexpected data. So uh, there are these, someone mixing code and data. Uh, there are these very common bad patterns uh, that really have haunted us for the last decade, few decades. And uh, because people always sort of want to do the latest, greatest, uh, uh, most sexiest thing uh, that's out there, uh, they still forget that it's always the same things. That's why we always keep making the same mistakes because we think it it changed. It no longer matters, but it still matters. Yeah, because you know, most of the times when you're learning these uh, programs, whether you're in a university setting or something, mm -hmm. that you're switching from one tool to the other. Yeah. So most of the times, uh, students usually find that they will end up gravitating towards the, you know, the easiest tool to use. Yeah. So and, and it's it's not about learning the tool. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a common mistake when people teach cybersecurity. They teach you how to use the tool. The tools will change. Uh, teach students what the tool does. How does the tool work? And I think that's much more important because then as the tool changes, someone next year will come up with a better, prettier tool to do the same attack. So yes, no, you have to click yeah. a, several, a different button, yeah, but it's still the same attack. It still does the same thing. And if you understand that, then it's really easy to switch from one tool to the other. So now, when you say how to, teaching them how the tool works, what do yeah. you actually mean by that? I mean, for example, you have an attack tool like Burp. You know, that uh, big attack web application. Yeah. Um, don't just teach them how to click the buttons in the tool. Teach them that, hey, this header that you're injecting, it actually works because it pretends for this application that you already authenticated or uh, to not cache the data. Uh, if you understand how caching works, then you know why this header is causing a problem. So that's so, sort of what this is about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have to go in depth into yeah. actually yeah. 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 how the attack yeah. is actually like, happening. One of my favorite classes to teach is uh, our intrusion detection class. And uh, we do use tools like you know, Snort and Seek and Tsvamp and Wireshark. But what we actually do is we go through the IP header byte by byte, bit by bit. What does this type of service field do in the header? What does the time to live do in the header? And then you will understand, hey, by manipulating that time to live in the header, I can actually bypass an IDS. So uh, some students hate the class because you always have to deal with hexadecimal and uh, binary and converting from one to the other. Uh, mm. But I think that's the... One student once called it the funniest class ever, and I, I agree, uh, because you get to play at the very low level. You really get to understand how networks work. And with that, you understand so much more about how vulnerabilities work. And uh, like, you know, why does this IP option cause a buffer overflow and things like this? That then applies to lots and lots of other applications, because the same bad thinking of developers and such that leads to these vulnerabilities. So another thing is uh, reporting. Now, like if you've had like a pen test report, how do you yeah. usually re report it and, uh, you know, getting to... Well, I, I think so a, a good pen test report, I think, again, is actionable. Uh, and I think there are a couple of things to the report. One is, that's a little bit some of the boring part of the report, but necessary. We just list the vulnerabilities, how to reproduce them, how to fix them. That's a very important part. Yeah. So as a pen test, you kind of have to understand a little bit how to fix them. But in addition to this boring and necessary part, the executive summary, where you basically sort of paint a big picture. Why do we have 100 vulnerabilities? It's not usually 100 individual mistakes that the developer makes, but there are certain key patterns. Well, your developers don't understand how to encode the output data. That's why you have 60 different cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And now you have sort of two levels of actionable items. One is you have one to work through the vulnerabilities and fix them. But then you also want to teach your developers about output encoding so they avoid vulnerabilities in the future. And actually, the best pen testing assignments, I think, are sometimes people call it purple teaming, where developers and pen testers work together. 
And as the developer, as the pen tester does their test, they talk to the developer and say, hey, I, I see this problem in, in your website. I think there may be a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, can you show me the code for this? And the developer shows the code. And now the pen tester either can tell them, oh, I see a problem here. Let me show you how this can be exploited. So now the developer learns how the vulnerability works, how it's being exploited. The next thing, next day, next hour, developer goes in and fixes the, fix the problem and now understands what the problem was and hopefully doesn't make it again. I once had a pen tester tell me he doesn't like that because he did it once. And when they submitted a report, all the vulnerabilities were fixed. And I said, that's great, because the opposite is you submit your report, a year later you come back, you're on a pen test, and all the same vulnerabilities are still there. Yeah. Uh, if the vulnerabilities are fixed, I'll hire you again. If you can get my developers to fix all the vulnerabilities, I'll hire you again. Yeah. <laughs> it means you're doing a good job, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now, that's, that's interesting. So uh, do you find, uh, no, that's now more of AppSec. Does it require more of AppSec or pen testing? Because those are two I, different. Yeah, I'm more on the defensive on the AppSec side, mm. but uh, I sort of grew up more as a developer. So that's kind of the side I'm at. I'm always a little bit jealous at pen testers. I think their life is way too easy. Yeah. It's kind of like stealing ice cream from a kid, but that's actually hard because the kid cries, web apps don't cry. Yeah. Uh, so it's. Um, uh, I like to fix stuff. I think it's more challenging, but I think it's also more rewarding to actually see the attacker not being able to get it. Yeah. Okay. So um, now, uh, when you're looking at it at the point of view of an executive, uh, I've recently had a conversation, actually I uploaded the, the episode today, we had a conversation with a CISO. And uh, when it comes to to communicating now, like such a pen test to a, a CISO board, how 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 do you usually ex uh, explain that to an executive? Well, the, first of all, you have to figure out what the business is about. You cannot explain it to an executive without knowing what the business is about, what the risks are that they're willing to accept, and then you have to basically explain it what risks they're exposing themselves to. You have to understand that there are some risks that business accept. And that's also important in that conversation. Uh, what you really tell the executive is not how to fix all vulnerabilities, because you can't. There will always be vulnerabilities. But you explain to them what are the risks that the business exposing themselves to by doing X. So you say, OK, um, uh, you have uh, this particular router in your network that is out of date. Why does this matter? Why does it matter to business? Well, because this firewall, let's say, is out of date. <coughs> Sorry. An attacker can get in your network and launch a ransomware attack. Yeah. So that's how you have to explain it to the executive. Uh, I always say it's a little bit like, uh, think about your normal store. Things get stolen out of stores. They're shoplifting. You would think that, I don't know how old stores are, thousands of years that people have little stores. You would think by now they have fixed shoplifting. <laughs> and you can fix shoplifting. You can fix shoplifting by putting like everything behind a wall and then someone giving you the item only after you ask for them and such. And there are stores that are secure like this. But they don't make a lot of money because it's very hard for someone to buy something. It's much, you're making much more money if people can walk through the store and see all the things and buy things that didn't know they wanted. Uh, so you have to find the right balance. And yeah, some of see this in stores where some of the cheap items maybe are even outside of the store. You have some of the discount fruit that are probably going bad tomorrow. And uh, if some of them get stolen, it's not a big deal, but it looks nice in front of the store and then more people come into the store. Yeah. And some of the expensive things you have in the back of the store, maybe 
you have to ask for like if you want an ipad or something like this uh, you're not putting that outside the store for people to look at you're putting that uh, inside the store and maybe even chain it down or do something like that so it's the same with any business with any security you have to understand the business you have to understand what risks the business is willing to accept and then also like you know what are priorities how do we effectively mitigate those risks? Like hospitals are another good example. If you go to the hospital, you want doctors to have access to your data. You don't want them to first worry about a 32 letter random password to get access to your data. <laughs> and um, if you go to a hospital and your arm is cut off and you say, hey, put arm back on, yeah? um, mm -hmm. the privacy of the data is a lot less important to you than uh, getting that that arm fixed, you know, so it, uh, it all depends on the risks that you're willing to accept. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, now, finally, uh, do you have any parting shots, uh, in terms of career guidance? Well, uh, I think, um, don't overlook the business. I think that the, the last discussion I think was very important. Like if you want to have a career, don't be the security person who always says no. There's always a reason not to do something. Uh, find ways to get things done for the business. Your business wants to have a fancy web application. Great. So let's talk about how can we do this securely? And what are some of the controls we put in place? So I, I think that's uh, really important uh, as you grow up in security. So from the little analyst in the corner, uh, clicking on logs to actually making decisions. Uh, I think that's sort of the, the real thing that you have to understand. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, so I guess that is it. Uh, I would like our um, listeners and our viewers to to watch episode 10, which is with Wilson Baker, so a data center manager uh, of NITA, which is national uh, information uh, something. I've forgotten the other part. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, please, uh, you can go and watch that episode 10. Yeah, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been interesting.